We saved the best for last, ladies. Uh, no pressure. Uh, I am so excited to, to be leading this conversation. Two women I admire uh, in, in many ways. And we also thought this couldn't be a more fitting way to close the summit. Today's theme is all about leading the way forward. And these women have broken barriers. They've taken unconventional paths to success. They've built community in extraordinary ways uh, and, and across borders. And many of you uh, know who they are. They need no introduction. But just to put it in context in terms of the extraordinary power, influence, and su success on stage, uh, Indra Nui is a leader uh, who's at the helm of a $150 billion company leading PepsiCo's. Woo! Yeah, not a, not a small <laughs> number. Not, that's a lot of decimal points. Uh, yeah, it's a lot of zeros, That's too. a lot Oof. of zeros. Uh, leading a corporate family of over 260,000 employees around the world. And in her tenure, she's more than doubled the company's revenue while also aggressively diverse, diversifying uh, the company's product portfolio. Uh, professionally, Priyanka, I would say it's also very difficult to sum up your job title in, in one line as well. You're an actress, a Bollywood superstar, pop singer, uh, star of the very popular show Quantico, a former Miss World, a movie producer, uniform, UNICEF Goodwill ambassador and activist. And you also have, uh, Priyanka also has an extraordinary following of uh, close to, or about probably 100 million people around the world who follow her across her social platforms. So this gives you a sense of what influence and power looks like today. Women who've defied limitations and who inspire others. Uh, in our conversation as we close today, we'll hear about how their shared experiences have shaped their success. What are some of the common qualities that have united these career trajectories that are truly remarkable? And how they think about the impact that they have today both professionally, but in terms of advancing the opportunities for future generations of leaders to, to emerge. So Indra and Priyanka, many, many thanks for joining me here today. Thank uh, you for having us. I, I want to start off by you know, uh, going back to your childhood, which is something I did uh, with a speaker earlier today, because both of you have talked a lot about the influence of your parents and your mothers in particular on your career journeys and setting these formative values. Andrew, you grew up in a uh, socially conservative city and you described your mother as someone who was this interesting combination who would who adhere to traditional beliefs, never works or went to college, but she would always say to you, uh, I, I want you to get married when you're 18 and make sure you aspire to be the prime minister. Mm. So this very interesting, uh, which is good life goals to have, um, uh, maybe not 18, but uh, I'll take the prime minister part. Um, but these, you know, that's an interesting juxtaposition, particularly coming from a woman who didn't work, who never went to college, Reflect a little bit about the values that she shared and those cultural roots that you've cited as so formative in, in threading the different experiences of your life together. Um, Maura, thank you for having us here. It's great to be here with Priyanka, the beautiful and brilliant Priyanka. Oh. And I was just telling <laughs> Priyanka, only one of those two adjectives apply to me. You decide which one. <laughs> How humble. Uh, but. Uh, you know, interestingly, Moira, uh, in retrospect, now we talk about my upbringing and talk about my mother and things like that. What she did and what we went through was very normal for when we were growing up in Madras in the south of India. It was a conservative city, and every mother's dream was to get their daughter married off by age 18 or 20 at the latest, beyond which you were not quite marriageable. So uh, uh, mothers in particular worried a lot about how are they going to make sure the daughters have a good marriage with a good family and get settled? And once you get settled, you can do whatever you want. Can you prime minister, astronaut, do whatever you want. So it was get an education, preferably up to a master's, because we don't get a master's degree. Families would sort of cringe. Mm -hmm. uh, and get married to the right person. I remember, I come from the nerdy south. I come from the nerdy south too. My <laughs> grandmother was Malayali and she's a nurse. Okay, so we I mean, both everyone are nerds. in my family is either a doctor or an engineer. So we both come from a nerdy background, all right? So it was, if you don't, 
you don't have a master's degree and marry by the time you're 20, you're in trouble. So when you come from that sort of a background, everything seems normal because she was behaving true to the role. Uh, I'm glad she behaved that way because uh, we got our master's degrees, we studied hard, uh, and then she allowed us to also fly because the men in our family said, hey, you're not gonna constrain the women. And I still remember this incident where uh, my sister got admission to a school outside of our city and she wanted to go away because it's very hard to get admission to the school and she got in and she, w she wanted to go and my mother said, you can't go unless you get married. And my sister said, what the hell, I've gotten admission to this very prestigious school, I am Ahmedabad and I don't want to get married, I want to go. My mom said, if you go, I'm going to fast until I die. <laughs> okay? Which is very normal Indian threats. moms, it's Indian not, moms, okay? It's, it's not even dramatic, it's normal. It's very normal. <laughs> so she started a fast, and my grandfather said to her, she told us kids, it's okay if she dies, I'll take care of you all. <laughs> 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 and my father said the same thing, it's okay if she dies, we'll take care of you all, but you are going to school in Ahmedabad, and we've already paid the deposit. 24 hours later, my mother broke the fast. She's still alive. <laughs> she, <laughs> she's still alive. And so I think it was, she was normal. I'm glad she was. So she was the break. And my, um, the men in my family, my grandfather, my father, were the accelerator. So combination made it work. And, and Priyanka, I want to uh, turn to you because you uh, said that you grew up with parents who were relatively progressive in the sense that they treated you and your brother, you said, um, um, equally or relatively equally. But I was really struck because your, your father um, had a professional career, but your mother did as well. She was uh, a double MD. She spoke, she uh, speaks eight languages. Am I right? Eight languages? My mother is a full overachiever. I, I mean, that, that isn't even overachiever. <laughs> I mean, I can't even like think of eight languages here on the spot to name. Um, she has, uh, I, I don't know if that, yeah, the, yeah, that doesn't, what that says about me, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, she has a business and the <coughs> like. Uh, how did that shape the way that you thought about your career in the sense that you had parents whose professional ambitions were very, very strong um, and, and, and rooted in a way that I would imagine was a little bit different um, in the cultural context of some of your friends? Um, I think, um, first of all, I'm really excited to be here and I am a big fan of not just Forbes, but of Indra. So I'm really happy to be on this panel, um, especially in a room full of female achievers. Um, Y'all are all boss ladies, so thank you for being here. <laughs> um, my upbringing really shaped me as a woman, um, as a person, because both my parents were super overachievers. I mean, way to set your children up for failure. Both my, my mom is a double MD, she's an OBGYN and an ENT. My dad was a surgeon, a musician, like a singer. He was also a composer and an artist, he used to paint. And my mom spoke nine languages, is a licensed pilot, is like... I forgot the pilot part, like, yeah, of, co of course, like, of course she's a pilot. So of course you're a pilot, yeah. of course. She was like, we didn't have TV then. Um, you did, you just wanted to be an overachiever. But um, both my, my parents were very progressive in their, in their mindsets, especially coming from a country at that time, which India was, which was a little bit like this, you know, a woman's life sort of ends when she gets married. Because after that, yeah, you can think about progressive families will tell mm -hmm. you, yeah, you can achieve whatever, but your milestone is to get married. Whereas um, my parents were, my mom even now says that, you know, because I'm in my 30s, obviously it's like way over the hill. I should have been married like <laughs> a decade ago. Uh, but my mother still says, she's like, you know, you'll get married the day you find someone who will, who will appreciate how hard you have worked to get where you are, who will appreciate the sacrifices you made. And that's the man you will get married to. And if you don't, it doesn't matter. We're in the world of science, you can still have babies. And I was like, what kind of mom says that? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. But it was such a, but the idea was the philosophy behind it, that it didn't define me. And even my father, like my grandmother used to always say, oh my God, she's an actress. Oh my God, she can't even cook. She'll never get married. And uh, my dad was like, yeah, it's okay. I'll send a cook with her wherever she goes. <laughs> I was like, yeah, daddy. And he was true till the day he died. Like I had a cook with me that was pre-selected by my father because he knew I was particular about food that he would send with me wherever I went because he was like, she can't cook, um, which is great for my figure, but probably not good for me. 
<laughs> That's what I used to I used to tell him that always. And he was like, no, my parents had such a different way of thinking. My mom, like ever since I was a kid, always told me, you make the you make mistakes, which all of us do. You might make wrong decisions and you might be afraid to come and tell your parents. But courage of conviction is the only integrity that you need to have. Whether you make a mistake or not, whether you tell um, you make good, bad, or ugly, it should all be yours. My dad, I was obsessed with Cinderella, like all kids are, um, with like fairy tales and Disney and like, I was like, oh, I'm Cinderella. And I was a klutz as a child. Like I couldn't walk straight without dropping something or breaking something or, you know, breaking some bones. And um, <laughs> my dad used to call me Bandarella instead of Cinderella. Now Bandar in Hindi means monkey. <laughs> and he used to say, you're a Bandarella. And I used to get really offended. I was like, why would you call me a Bandarella? I'm Cinderella. I could be pretty. I could wear a gown. I could be Cinderella. He was like, no, you drop shit around all the time. You know, somebody <laughs> always has to be walking behind you so you don't break. You're a Bandarella. <clears throat> so one day I got really offended and we had this conversation. And I went up to him, like, you know, with all my, like, emotions in check. I said, Dad, it makes me feel really bad when you say Bandarella. So he sat me down for the first time, seriously explained it to me. He said, whatever you are and whatever you might want to be, that is the best version of you. So you drop stuff around or you are a clumsy and you're a klutz, but it's you. And that's what makes you special. Why would you ever want to fit into some glass slipper? And I was like, I didn't understand that. Mm -hmm. I, Nine, I think I understood it at 15 when I knew what a glass ceiling was because he said, you don't want to fit into a glass slipper that someone has made for you, that you need to fit into. You break the glass ceiling. And at 15, I was like, whoa, that's what that meant. <laughs> Until then, I was like, where's the glass ceiling? <laughs> but it exists in such a big way and that really shaped me. So like. Things like that about my parents coming from a country like that really shaped who I was. Clear, clearly, and I just spoke to my mother who lives in Manhattan, and I said, "Mom, I'm going to do this panel with Priyanka," and the first thing she said to me was, "Tell Priyanka to get married and settle down." <laughs> <laughs> The only thing she asked me to pass on to. So if any of you know any <laughs> single men that you want to set Priyanka, we'll put a board upside outside and you can and just start. And if I stayed on the phone for two more minutes, no, if I stayed on the phone for two more minutes, she'd have recommended five guys that she found in some. <laughs> but, but 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 clearly, culturally, there, there are these defining moments and expectations um, that that even when you are encouraged to think bigger and and, and beyond, um, there are these still these moments such as marriage but that I are defining. Like, I feel like it's really not just a cultural thing. I think women like think about it. All the fairy tales, all the fairy tales we've always read, end when the princess gets married. Why is there no story beyond that? That's the end of her life. Is oh my God, she got the prince and she's married. That's the next role you're gonna play. There we go. We've got your next movie. We've After got she gets married, what happens? <laughs> um, but but I think that 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 brings up a, a, a good point just around around these cultural narratives. But you know, you mentioned the words sort of courage and conviction, and and Indra, you 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 talked a lot about it as well in terms of fi finding finding your passion. I was really struck about your your uh, journey to this country because you asked your parents for permission to study in America and they were so sure that you wouldn't get a scholarship that they said, yes, apply, <laughs> go ahead. Um, and you did and you got in. I'm, I'm, I'm curious, what about this country? What about the opportunity? What did you see in the world? At, and your ambitions that you didn't see at home, that you wanted to pursue in, in a way that many would see as very scary um, and that, that unknown? Well, let's, first of all, we are a few generations apart, okay? She's, she's as old as one of my kids, so let's just be clear here. When I grew up in India, we had no TV. Um, we had no um, cell phones, um, no internet, of course. Uh, Going to the movie theater was like the biggest adventure for the family. I mean, we planned months in advance to go see Sound of Music, okay? Uh, uh, so life was very different. I mean, life was about going to school, coming home, studying, playing in the garden in the house, going back into the house. So it's a very simple, uncomplicated life. Uh, going to business school in India, studying in India's... Uh, uh, 
was again uncomplicated because life didn't have as, much di as many distractions and as much of the social upheavals that my kids seem to be having in New York City today. <laughs> so given that, uh, when I went to them and I said, I want to go to the States because everything we read about America was, this was the dream country. Everybody was dreaming for a slice of Americana. Students who graduated from the best schools in India wanted to come to the United States because this was the best. The colleges were the best, the universities were the best. Life here was spectacular. So you sort of get caught up in that whole uh, spirit. And when I applied and got into Yale, my parents were so sure I wouldn't get any scholarship money. They said, of course you can go. And then when the uh, scholarship and loan money came by, and they were sort of in a dilemma. How do we send this young girl off to the States who's unmarried? Because once she goes unmarried, she's not marriageable at all. Nobody will marry her because she's now gone alone to the States. So there was, there was a big family meeting. Everybody got together. Should we send her or not? I was going. <laughs> but then, should we send her? You let them have their moment. Oh, sure, sure. The whole family had its meeting. And then they did something very interesting. They contacted all the friends of ours who had already come to the United States and told all of them that they had to check up on me. So every week, I'd have somebody come to Yale to check up on me. You know, Is she all right? Is she running around with some guys? Is she... Were drinking, you? smoking. Were you? Were, were you? No, I was, I was like, the biggest nerd at Yale. God no. help. <laughs> you know, I didn't make good use of my time at Yale. Let's put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> and so I was, I was totally a nerd. But, um, you know, when they ticked, uh, ticked off all the boxes, they said, okay, you can go now. But they set up a support system for me. And then the rest is history. That was 40 years ago. So you, you had this ambition to, to come to the States. Priyanka, you have a different relationship coming, coming here. You, you came to the States in your teens to, to live with family, ultimately returned to India. I read there was a bully that was one of the motivating, motivating. there was one person, right? I, we won't name names, but if you want to name I names. I named her on TV before. Um, I uh, spare her. Well, <laughs> but but <coughs> one, one, one young woman helped shape, uh, shape your return back to India. But you had a really interesting trajectory since then. You planned to become an aeronautical engineer, but you ended up being Miss World. And along came the Bollywood producers and persuaded you to start acting, acting to the point where you had 50 movies under your belt and one of the most, if not most famous celebrities in India, the second largest country in this world. I mean, unbelievable success. And you came to the U.S. at the apex of your career, at least in terms of, of your professional career having been built in India. And I, I, I'd like you to reflect a little bit. What was it like coming here, not necessarily having to start over, but having to prove yourself in a different way when people often didn't even understand the industry that you were coming from? Um, yes, that was my my relationship with the United States is is very interesting because my uh, adolescent years were spent here, and you know how important twelve to sixteen is for just a human being and to shape them. So I kind of became an amalgamation of the East and the West wherever I went after that. So when I came back to America, um, I was doing music. I was signed as a recording artist with Interscope. And I came in to do, I'm a fan of music. I love everything music. So I was having the best time of my life. But I'm also not someone who's entitled. I've always achieved everything that I have on my own. I did not have advisors. I started working when I was 17 years old. My parents were physicians. They had no idea of entertainment. Uh, my dad just loved music. But that's all we knew. And to navigate the business of entertainment and to navigate being a young girl, you know, in the big bad world of entertainment and now with all the conversations that are happening, you guys know it's not the easiest thing. So, but I was never entitled. So when I came to America this time around, which was at like 27, 28, I was not afraid to walk into a room and introduce myself. I would walk into a room and I would say, yes, my name is Priyanka Chopra. You may not know me, I'm an actor from India. I've done about 50 something movies. But um, I'm also someone who's not defined by my ethnicity or where I come from. I'm a woman, I'm an actor, I'm an artist, and I'd like to see where that takes me. So entitlement, even now, is not something that I hold 
Mm. Um, and I expect, like whenever I walk into the room, I don't expect each and every one of you to know me at all. I've, I've worked in a completely different country, in a completely different content, continent, which doesn't mean that you need to know about it. Like when I go back to India, I remember I was um, at the Oscars the first time when I went two years ago, and I was uh, presenting I love that. The when I was at the Oscars, right? It's like... <laughs> 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 what is an important part of the story? I, I, I love to know, but it I was love like that. So, like, nonchalantly, <laughs> I love it, yeah. It was, I was presenting with Leah Schreiber, and after we presented, we were backstage because there was a segment going on. So, we were standing at the bar, and like, some people who had won were coming in, and Leah was like, oh my God, that's the most amazing movie, and this guy has done blah, blah, movie. And I was like, oh, not trying to be ignorant, but I was. And I was like, I didn't know him. He's like, what? you didn't know him? And I was like, yeah, because I sort of grew up in another country. If I name a celebrity from my country, would you know him? <laughs> and he was like, oh, I get it. But that's exactly what it is. I may, I, I know American music and movies and, and um, because I consume it back in India, but I don't know all kinds of pop culture. But I had to learn, like when I came in and I started doing Quantico, which was, I mean, ABC, network TV, a character, girl who plays, is, um, I mean, a character that I play, which is an American girl. She's not Indian. And I had to be culturally sound. Like, I needed to speak like her. I needed to, you know, crack jokes like her. Pop culture. I needed to know pop culture like her, which I didn't. There were lines which would come in. I still remember this one line where, and it's horrible because now I know her so well, but when I first <laughs> landed, I didn't know her. And I got so much shit from my co-actors for it. There was a line which said, yeah, even Ronda Rousey loses sometimes. And I was like, who's she? <laughs> <laughs> and my, my co-actor, Johanna Brady, who was most of the time my pop culture teacher, would turn around and be like, she would whisper it in my ear and then I would pretend like I knew her because I didn't want to sound stupid. But I had to learn. I wasn't entitled about it. And I think that really took me uh, in a different direction this time around. So, so being confident, but not entitled. and and. And self assured. Self assured. Yeah. And Indra, yeah. I feel like that's been a thread that's been present in, in your career because so often, you know, you have been the only woman in, in the room. And you talked about earlier in your career when you would go into meetings with men and they wouldn't look at you or they would double check your numbers. And yet it seemed that you had this sense of confidence to uh, in, in yourself or, or your work um, that allowed you to, to navigate those obstacles. And, and when, you, when you were named, uh, appointed um, CEO, uh, you had said um, that, that, you know, that there were you know, unique challenges that you faced, right? Being a woman, being a woman of color, um, being a first um, within your industry. Talk a little bit about how you navigated that and where you drew from to, to have the anchor in these challenges. You know, look, uh, in my early days working in corporate America, I never really fit in because I dressed differently. I didn't have money to have good clothes. So I'd buy two suits, you know, a black suit and a beige suit, and I'd make four suits out of it. I'd mix and match them. And uh, the fifth day, I always worried about what am I going to do? Am I going to repeat the cycle? Um, so nobody gave me uh, dressing instructions. Did you worry about fitting in? Um, I worried about how I was perceived because I was the only woman, right? Already walking in, I looked different. I didn't want my clothes also to give people some sort of a sartorial seizure. So it was one of those things where I knew I didn't dress very well because I'd look at the other women and say, wow, how do they pull it off? So beautifully coiffed, you know, they look so well put together. Why do I look always a black suit, beige suit, white blouse? You know, always, is always the same. I decided after a while that I'm never going to win the looks battle. So I'm going to focus on, this is the brains part. So I focused on doing a job better than anybody else could do it. So pretty soon, people started to say, we only want Indra on the assignment. Or let's put Indra on the job because they got very comfortable that if you gave it to her or gave it to me, it will get done. Not just get done, it'll get done exceedingly well. So I started to depend more and more on my brains and my hard work as opposed to how I looked or how I talked or how I made comments in meetings. That comes with a package, you know. So think of me not as a complete package, but as a brain wrapped in ways that you are not familiar with. So uh, 
That's the only way I could justify myself. So, so brains was your common language, right? That's, it was that's it. I said, that's all you're going to think about. But did you have to work harder than everyone else in the room? I, and the time that I started to work in, uh, when I graduated from business school in 1980 in the United States, I think all women had to work about 50% harder than men. I think today it's about 20% and still you've got to work harder than the men. But when I started, it was 50% harder than men. And you know, being somebody of a different ethnicity, different way of dressing, I had 50 plus. At least that's my perception. Nobody gave me this number. I'm just throwing out these numbers. God, there is no <laughs> scientific study. You're a pretty study. smart woman. I feel, like, just, I feel like it's That's yeah, how it felt at that time. Yeah. That's how it felt. And so, in a way, the fact that I had to fight for everything uh, just made me a better person. But in retrospect, you know, there were a lot of trade-offs one had to make because you had needed time to do things so well. So it came out of some other bucket. And, and I want to talk about those trade-offs in a little bit because I think so often, you know, we look at successful women and particularly because there aren't that many in, mm. in the respective arenas and we look at the success and it looks wonderful, but there is a backstory, there's hard work, trade-off and, and, and sacrifice, and there's never a smooth ascendancy to the top. So I want to switch gears and, and, and talk about one or two of the defining struggles in your careers that were formative in bringing to where you are today, the ones that stung the most and that were the most painful and pot potentially if you're living them in, in the public eye. Priyanka, I loved a quote that you said. Um, you said, I don't believe that you can sit and wish for something and it'll happen. The soles of your feet have to be blistered. There's no pretty picture of hard work. There's no success story that doesn't have shadows of pain doubt, fear, lack of sleep, and illness. But when you step out of the light, and all uh, step out in the light, all that gets hidden, and the effort and the struggle gets hidden. The path is not easy for any success story. So when you think about the perception versus the reality, are, can you share one or two of those setbacks or those moments that were blistering, uh, that were so critical to allowing you to achieve what you've achieved? Um, a couple of times, many times through my career, my career now is about 18 years old, and um, I think when I first started, uh, and I, I, I started with being Miss World, I won a beauty pageant, and then I had movie offers that came to me because obviously producers thought it made business sense to cast Miss World in a movie. People come and watch it. I don't know, I could act. Um, but the first thing that came with that was like, I still remember there was this, um, so Indian movies have songs and dances, right? So there was this one song in which, um, obviously I played the escort in the, in the, in the movie, because that's what pretty girls do. But um, I was supposed to be this escort and this song, I was supposed to like, you know, be like seductive towards this guy. And um, I was very excited, but it was one of my first few movies with a really big, ginormous Indian actor. And I was really excited about, you know, bringing in the aspect, the human side of, of this escort. And uh, I remember this song and I was speaking to the director and I said, would you speak to my stylist and just explain to him what you want in terms of clothes and stuff. I'm standing right next to him, like behind him. He's sitting on his chair, you know, in that really entitled way. And he picks up the phone and he goes, listen, people are gonna come into the movies to watch her when she shows her panties. So it needs to be really short so that I can see her panties. You know those people <laughs> sitting up front? They should be able to see your panties. And he said it like four times. And it's not even pretty in Hindi. It's worse. <laughs> um, I just, and I'm 18 years old, 19. And I'd shot two days for that movie, I remember. And I went back home that night and I said, Mom, I can't, I, I can't, I, I can't, I can't look at his face. I mean, if that's what he thinks of me, if that's how small I am, there's no space for growth. And I remember my mom was like, well, then don't do it. I'd signed a contract, I'd signed short two days. The next day we sign a check, which was more than my remuneration at this point, um, of the two days of shoot to the producer. And I just walked out of the movie and I said, I'm sorry, I can't work. And I've till date never worked with him. He's come to me with three other movies and I don't even think he knows why, but it shaped me in such a big way in my head that I said, I'm never, ever, whatever I decide to be will be my choice. How I want to be perceived will be my choice. How you perceive me is how I will show you I want to be. Perception is reality, and my perception is going to be my identity. 
and my choice, whatever that might be. No one is, no one is the decision maker in my life. And it completely shaped me. There was a second time when um, I remember I started working in, in America and I was sitting in this whole room of music producers that were trying to figure out like what to do with my sound and everyone, like everybody keep getting, kept getting stuck at the word Bollywood with me as if an Indian with me. She's an Indian artist, she's an Indian girl. Like every time somebody writes about me, even now, like people define me. I'm a very, very proud Indian, but my roots are not my identity. They don't define my ability to have to have merit or to be the smartest person in the room or to be the one who breaks the glass ceiling. It's something I'm proud of. But it started defining and diminishing what my ability to be was. Um, and they kept, and like I'm always written as, the Indian actress, blah, 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 does, uh, you know, walked out of, of her apartment sashaying in the silver dress. But it's the Indian actress. I mean, would they do that with anyone else? Would you, would you be the American Moira Forbes? Like, would you? I, like I, I'm not sashaying out of my apartment <laughs> in any silver outfit like that. So you know I, what I'm saying? I would run toward that, but for different reasons. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but, 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 it's, but, but it's true. But, but you do get bucketed, right? I um, always got stereotyped and, like, put into that box that, oh, I can, um, I can only be the exotic, beautiful girl. I can only be, you know, uh, the engineer or, or, or whatever the stereotypes of people's heads were. But that was something that I wanted to break. And that really diminished my spirit for a little while. I was, I told myself that, you know, and, and I was not cast in, in, in things, be in, in projects because um, of that because it was my limitation that I came from an industry which is very different. But I made that my asset because then I become a triple threat. I can dance, sing, and act. <laughs> that, that is a triple threat. And sachet in a silver and dress. And in a silver dress. Um, Indra, I want to turn to you because Priyanka mentioned sort of that, that you get put in this bucket and you really were a barrier breaker in this country um, as the first you know, one of the first female CEOs to run an organization at scale, uh, uh, an Indian woman um, to do so, which was also notable. And there haven't been that many women after you. And so there are buckets, you know, whenever we talk about sometimes female CEOs, we talk about them through a gender lens. Mm. Um, you know, questions that we wouldn't ask male CEOs, um, similar to what you mentioned, male actors, that we do ask as female CEOs, but there are different realities. And you mentioned earlier some of the trade-offs that are required uh, when you do have very intense professional ambitions. And I think you've been really, you know, I, I'm, I'm very grateful because you've had very candid conversations around the challenges of navigating both career and family. You've said that, that, quote, women cannot have it all and that the biological clock and the career clock are in total conflict with, with one another, total conflict. And in your life, you said you haven't had regrets, but you've had heartaches mm -hmm. in reference to what that's meant for your daughters and, and your family. Talk a little bit about that. And is there another path? Are we being unrealistic when we uphold female CEOs and ask them to run the world, but when they also take a traditional path sometimes around motherhood, they get judged and there's backlash? Look, any way you look at it, motherhood is a full-time job, especially when your kids are babies. Um, being an executive is a full-time job. Being a wife is a quasi full time ish job. Uh, does, today's does, does, does your husband even think it's a job? Like, does he, does he, does he, he this makes my it on point the radar of view. I'm not so really speaking good. for my husband. Uh, and what? in today's world, when you have aging parents, especially for daughters, that's also a responsibility. I'm not saying it's a job. It's a labor of love, but a responsibility. There's only 24 hours in a day, and we have to do all these jobs. Be a parent, be an executive, be a, you know, daughter. In, in the Indian case, also daughter-in-law. Okay, uh, and somehow find time for yourself. How do you make that happen? So there are trade-offs you make all the time. And uh, in one way, I think all of us women have been told we can do everything. We've been given hopes and dreams and the education. And then we have these other issues to think about. How do we juggle all of this? 
if companies, communities, societies don't come together to help us, how are we going to grow the population of the country? So I think it's very important that we all understand that if you struggle with these choices, you're not crazy. You are human. What we have to do in companies is give you an infrastructure in the company to allow you to have a family, men and women, and allow you to come to work, but bring the two together by having near-site or on-site daycare like we do at PepsiCo. And as you progress and get to the middle management levels where you have to work even harder, because remember it's a pyramid, it keeps getting narrow, and you have to work even harder than everybody else to sort of rise to the top when your kids are teenagers and they need you even more, we have to make sure that we grease those kids for you. That's where all the unconscious bias comes in companies. That's where you struggle with people rolling their eyes when you're talking. All of that stuff happens. We have to make sure that your life at work uh, is made easier because you don't have to fight all those battles. It could be made easier, though, but it still comes with heartache at times. Tremendous at every point. And look, men and women today go through the heartaches, but... Whatever happens, women go through it a lot more because, you know, I don't know about you guys, when my kids were small, anything they missed at home, even if dad was at home, they call mom. <laughs> mom would be in the office. Hey, your dad's in his office. Can you go call him? He's right there. <laughs> mom, you tell us. And then the worst is when the dad calls you and says, where's my shirt? <laughs> <laughs> Do you have that? Mm -hmm. It's in the cupboard. And no, it's not in the cupboard. Her, it's six inches to the right. And her, and her, <laughs> it's six inches. You got that too? Andrew, I, I have to Why say. Why did you just move the head six inches to the right? My husband's in the room, so I really like the. Please, you can't say yeah, this? I, no, you, I'm happy you're saying this oh, because okay. I I'm say like, this okay, to him all the time, so I feel much it's better six than Andrew is saying right. this. Um, because Why did you move it six inches? I didn't move it. You moved it. But it doesn't matter. For the sake of harmony, you go, yeah, I did it. <laughs> I'm not going to argue. I am not going to argue. My daughters will say, Mom, stand up for your rights. Why? <laughs> Why? It's not worth it. It's, it's a losing battle. Your dad's the best. See, for someone who's not married, <laughs> pick your battles. Pick Check. your battles. Yeah, no, Got no. it. <laughs> Just say he's the best. Even better. You're the best, honey. Absolutely. The best. There hey, you, you go. say that to my husband, too, so don't <laughs> give me this. I'm, 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 I'm I do say that to your husband. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm taking notes, Andrew. I'm taking yeah, just notes. Just keep saying you're notes. the best. You're the best. It works. Um, you're the best. It works. But that's it's a always, lot of, it's but painful, that's a lot of though, the trade-offs. But that's a lot of pressure, though, right? Because sure. you have to uplift your husband, your kids, 260,000 employees. That doesn't alleviate. That doesn't. I mean, I'm not, that, that's a number, that's a real big number, but that doesn't leave a lot of time for you. So how do you not let sort of the threads come undone? Well, what, see, that's, people have often asked, do you have time for yourself? But when I worry about my husband, that's time for myself because this is my husband. When I worry about my kids, I'm worrying about myself because that's my kids. It's my mother, it's my in-laws. So in a way, I may not have time to sort of sit around in a spa for hours, but if I took my kids, I have daughters, remember? If I took them with me to the spa, we have together time. <laughs> and uh, if you can convince your husband to come for a pedicure with you, that's together time. You so go. you gotta, you gotta figure out all of these. <laughs> you gotta <laughs> figure yeah. out unnatural situations mm -hmm. to be together. <laughs> to because be together. otherwise, there is no time. Unfortunately, there's only 24 hours in a day. You have to stretch it. Yes, you give up time for yourself, stuff that you'd like to do when you want to hang around with your own uh, girlfriends, you don't have the time. That's par for the course. You can do it all. So I, I, I have a few questions before we wrap up, but I think, you know, I mentioned earlier today that the past 18 months have been this watershed moment in time for, for women around talking about inequities uh, with a new sense of urgency and, and commitment and the like, which has been good and that they're bringing it to the surface. You two represent different generations and different vantage points around these issues. And even the word Priyanka, you, you call yourself a feminist. You've, you, you, you embrace that term. Uh, I would love for you to each sort of talk about how you think about what's, what's going on um, and, and that notion of feminism, feminism today and Indra also, you know, how it's evolved over the course of, of your career. I'll start with you, Priyanka. Um, I, I think growing up was conflicted about feminism. I didn't understand what the word meant, like a lot of us don't still. 
It took me a little time to understand what it means. Now, feminism is different to everyone. To me, what feminism stands for is give me the ability to make my own decisions without judging me. Just the same kind of freedom men have had for such a long time. Women should sound like this. Women should wear this. Women at this point should get married. We're always told what we should do. We need to be able to decide what we should do, whatever that is. So to me, that freedom is feminism. Thank you. Second, I really, I think that, I, I think that growing up, the one thing that I, looking back now, what I realized was for such a long time, we've always been told as women that the best one will get the boy or the best one will get the job. And we sort of are, have been conditioned to push each other out of the way so that we can be the better one. And if we empower another woman, right? If I empower a woman who's sitting next to me, I might lose the opportunity. It's conditioning. And we've been conditioned to be that way. This is the first time in a very long time, at least in the, my lifetime, that I have seen women embracing each other, women empowering each other, women standing up for each other. And that is such a critical time. When women fought before us, generations before us, for us to have the ability to vote, we don't even think about it today sitting in this room. Think about what all they went through. So what we're doing today is we're, we're seeding the thought for your daughters, for, your, for my daughter's daughters, for kids who will not have to think about the gender disparity. They'll not have to think about like, how it feels to be a woman who's marginalized or, or what it feels like to be, um, to be traumatized by men in power. They won't have to think about it because we will create a world where men are afraid to do that. We will create a world together where we stand by each other and say, nope, I'm sorry, you're not doing this to my daughter because you did it to me and that's enough. And that is such a powerful time to be a woman. And, and, and you have that unique vantage point, right? Um, generationally and, 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 and given the world that, that you're in and that this amazing perspective to see the opportunity that exists. Indra, given your career, uh, how, how do you approach this conversation and, and what Priyanka mentioned and, and the optimism um, that we all have in terms of being able to, to move the m momentum forward? You know, I look at the next couple of decades and say it's a decade of women. Because if I look at college degrees, women are getting it in larger numbers than men. If I look at the top grades, more women are getting the top grades than the men. So if you really want to run a successful company, you have to recruit the best and the brightest, i.e. bring the women into the company. So we have to create new companies, new environments to make women thrive. Uh, because if you hire them and then they leave you, it's more expensive than not hiring them in the first place. So I'm a firm believer that the next couple of decades are the decades of women when it comes to working. But you can't put all the onus on women. We have to create the uh, support structures to allow them to balance the different roles they have to play. Because there are some roles you cannot delegate to men. We have to do it ourselves. And so I think it behooves companies to help women achieve their goals. And to Priyanka's point, I think we have to have our own sisterhood. You know, I've been telling the story recently. Uh, about three months ago, on my HBO popped up uh, an episode of Sex and the City. I never watched it. So you're I sort of now. fell in love with the now, first Indra. episode, and I watched all 94 episodes. I binge watched it. <laughs> <laughs> I binge watched it. Did and I have to tell did you. Did your husband watch it with you? Was what? it one of the? Did your husband watch no, no, it with no, you? Was no, it one of the chance. shared activities? No. The the great thing about that show is because there's so many scenes that focus on the first word as opposed to the other three words. You can fast forward, <laughs> which is what I did. So, but I love the show. Why did I love the show? Every episode had a lesson, uh, an interesting thing to think about. But the biggest takeaway was the sisterhood of those four women: Carrie, Charlotte. Miranda and uh, who was the fourth one? Yeah. Samantha. <laughs> My God, the sisterhood they had was fantastic. What happens to us? Why don't we have a sisterhood? Somebody shutting off my mic because you want me to talk about. <laughs> 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 but you know, what happens to our sisterhood? Why don't we have our own sisterhood? I think the more I looked at that show, I said, man, we have to create our own sisterhoods. We have to have our own safe spot 
where we can talk about our issues. Because you can't talk about it at home, because nobody wants to hear you talk about your work problems at home. We need our sisterhood. We need an environment where our sisterhood does not judge us, but gives us constructive feedback, where we can talk about Mr. Big in a you know, comfortable place. You know what I mean? <laughs> For those of you who have seen the show. <laughs> but I have to tell you, that show profoundly altered my thinking only because I didn't think about the show and the fashions, which were awesome, but really about what was behind the covers, the sisterhood of women. So the only way we're going to be able to balance everything going forward is if we don't do what Priyanka talked about, worry that the person next to us, the woman next to us is gonna take away our future potential because the next level is gonna have fewer women because they have a quota for women or whatever. Yeah. Rather say, let's pull us all, let's pull ourselves each other. And that sisterhood needs to form. And when we get there, I think there's no stopping us. I love that so, sentiment, I love that. Well, I, uh, I, have, I have two questions to, um, to, to wrap up uh, before, uh, before we finish the conversation. Each of you have broken barriers. Each of you serve as incredible role models around the world. I would love for, for each of you to reflect on what, what, the other, what the other woman on the stage represents in terms of, of opportunities for women. Um, Priyanka, how do you see the work that Indra has done uh, as a role model for your generation uh, and, and what it means? And Indra, I would ask the same question to you. I mean, there's really the one similarity between both Indra and I are we come from small towns and we had big dreams and we didn't let anything else define that. And that's why she's someone I'm a huge fan of, not because, you know, she's <laughs> she's the boss lady of how many employees, you said? Two on, how many? 260? Two, what? How many employees, employees for employees? PepsiCo? 260,000. Yeah, yeah, just about. Just a few. I wanna, I wanna be the Quarter boss lady billion, for that many you know. employees. Yeah. But mm -hmm. um, not because of that, but because of what she stands for as a woman. She's a proud woman who's an achiever, who, th and that, but that doesn't define her when she walks into a room. She doesn't walk into a room like a lot of male CEOs do, you know, where you can tell by the sniff of their cologne how, how, how much of a CEO they are. Um, <laughs> and the hair gel, and yeah, the hair gel too. And the too. gel, and the suit. Yeah. But Indra walks in, like she said, not just because of her brains, but for me, as, as, as a girl who wants to be the biggest that I can be in whatever field that might be, she stands for integrity. She stands for being so self-assured that it's anything is like water off of a duck's back, you know? She has this grace and charm and humor mm. that she deals her life with. She's a mom, she's a, you know, daughter, she's a wife, and she does all of that. I mean, I went for lunch at her house and she cooked. She cooked, I mean, I can't cook. So I really admire that about women. And she cooked like from scratch this Indian food and like she's completely wholesome. And I think when I like, as I'm growing up and as I see myself going forward in my life, I would wanna be a wholesome woman and that's what I admire her for, is a wholesome woman. And Indra, what would you say? Uh, uh, what would you say about Priyanka. I'm smelling my cologne first. <laughs> <laughs> we know she can't cook, so you know you can't, you can't, uh, you, I gotta, you can't I gotta get that. this cologne. But, uh, <laughs> you know, I just think you were boss. I you got it. I, I don't think anybody comprehends how big a figure Priyanka is in India. I mean, she's mm -hmm. not normal. She's like awesome. Mm -hmm. uh, when, really she walks, when she walks in the street, she'll get mobbed. When she lands in the airport, it's like hundreds of people clamoring to see her. She's like hot stuff. And so, uh, you know, the amazing part about Priyanka is not only is she a fabulous actress, a fabulous dancer, a fabulous musician. I'm sure many of you have never seen Bollywood films, but when you see her in one, it is spectacular. So most of her movies are like gross bestsellers, they just grow so much money. But in addition to all of that, she's not one of these vacant uh, movie stars. She's a person with great intellectual uh, background. She's a person with enormous brains, aeronautical engineer who became an actress. I mean, that's not that's simple those stuff. That's usually not in the same sentence, and, right? And yeah, yeah. she's worried about humanitarian causes, social causes, is always coming forward to help people in need. So I think uh, she represents 
one of the most progressive arms of moviedom, if you want to call it that. And uh, if people like Priyanka can lend their name and really lean in on these causes that change society like she's doing, the world will be a better place. So Priyanka, thank you for everything you do. I think she's just awesome. Uh, well, <laughs> well, with that, I think that is a, a good place, a good place to end. I mean, I think it's thank you to, to both of what you do. Uh, you give hope, you give possibility, uh, you give inspiration to so many. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a great reminder of, you know, I, I love Ander when you, you talked about the power of the sisterhood and, uh, and, and, and needing to, uh, uh, free ourselves from some of the boxes and constructs that others put us in and have a sense of confidence and self-assurance mm -hmm. um, because within that and in that um, is where real opportunity for, for our strengths to come to play um, happen. So again, I, I want to thank you to two amazing women thank you. Um, thank you. and uh, who's... Thank you. Whose, whose power is extraordinary. Uh, thank you all. And, thank and you. whose gifts are extraordinary. So thank, thank you. you, ladies. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank Marla, you, thank Andra. You. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And with that. Thank you, guys. Um, thank you guys.